We gotta go to the bullpen. Welcome to the Highland Bullpen, the all-new podcast bringing America's pastime to Scotland shores. It doesn't matter if you're a Hall of Famer heading for Cooperstown or you're fresh out of the minor leagues. This is the podcast for you. Hi folks, it's Alan here. Tonight we've got a special guest, Matthew Robertson of the Seattle Mariners Lookout Landing podcast. And Matthew's going to give us a rundown of what to expect for the Mariners in 2021. Also a little bit of knowledge about the area and city of Seattle. And he might also let us into one or two secrets about some fandom of the Mariners. We hope you enjoy it. It's particularly pleasing for me. I'm the resident Mariners fan amongst the four of us that do this podcast. Dave Jr., who's a Tigers fan. Oh, sorry, Al- Alan is a Tigers <laughs> fan. And Dave Jr. is a Chicago White Sox fan. But we've got a fourth member of the, the Highland Bullpen as well, Matthew, and we're hoping he'll join us shortly. But yeah, welcome to the Highland Bullpen. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here. I'm very sorry about some of your team choices. I haven't had a lot of success <laughs> in recent years. I think the White Sox... I I mean, they're fun. I would be, I would love to be a White Sox fan right now. But basically, my entire life, the Mariners have not done anything special. I may be fortunate, Matthew, being that bit older, or probably quite a bit older than yourself. I got to see some of the, the better teams of the 90s and stuff as well. But yeah, it'd be great to get your view on what kind of Mariners are we going to see this season, Matthew? How optimistic are you? I would not say I'm particularly optimistic. I do think it will be fun because I like watching young players. You know, if you're going to be bad, I'd rather you be young and bad than old and bad, you know? So I don't expect them to do much in terms of playoffs or anything like that. Uh, I have been very frustrated with the team recently, or I guess the front office, not adding any free agents or really making any effort this offseason to get better. That's been a bit disappointing. I mean, I'm going to watch the Mariners no matter what. I signed a lifetime contract, you know what I mean? So I'll be watching and I don't know what the returns will be, but as long as there's baseball, I guess. That's what I said last season too, and I'm still kind of in that mindset. Like as long as they have a season, I'm happy. That's a good way to look at it. Last season maybe wasn't the season we would have expected or hoped for, but it was baseball, which was great because yeah. at one point it looked like we weren't we weren't going to get that. How do you look back on the Mariners last season then, Matthew? How did they how did they handle having no crowd and stuff like that? I mean, I think they did the best they can. I noticed as the season went on, they kept adding more and more of the cardboard cutouts, which I thought was very funny. Like they tried to make it seem like they had a full stadium. And I guess it just was a product of people deciding they wanted to see themselves on TV and paying money to get one of those cutouts. I think they did all right. I mean, I was happy with the way they handled it. They didn't have any crazy coronavirus outbreaks or anything, which made me kind of proud of the players. You know, whenever you realize that your players are following the rules or at least doing the best they can, that makes me feel better. Like they're not employed a team of idiots it seems like were you tempted to get your own cut out then Matthew not in particular that would have been pretty weird for me to be at home and then be watching the game on TV and see myself I don't know how I would have handled that that makes a lot of sense I mean you mentioned Matthew that your Mariners years haven't been littered with success but do you have a favorite kind of era from your time watching the Mariners yeah I think so so 2001 when they had literally the best team in American League history I was six years old so that was the most fun for me that one season I'll count as an entire era because that was kind of my introduction I do often wonder if they had been bad at the beginning of my life and during my fandom if I would have latched on this hard that was the most fun and then I would say Just the Cano years were also very fun. Those were my college years. Being able to follow the Mariners. I moved away from the Seattle area, but being able to follow them and still kind of have like a reason to, you know, it would have been very easy at that point. Like, oh, I'm leaving home, going to school. Like, I'll put the Mariners on the back burner. But the fact that they were good helped me keep interest, even though they never even made it to the playoffs. That's the thing about being a Mariners fan. Like the things that we talk about are so minor. Like if you were to talk to a Yankees fan or a Cardinals fan about like an 89 win season where we almost made the playoffs, they would just laugh at you. But for me, that's like literally the highlight of my adulthood as a Mariners fan. No, that's fantastic. And you're right, because we've got a supporter 
of one of the kind of baseball's elite joining us just now. Uh, or his oh. name's York- Yorkshire Dave. <laughs> And Yorkshire Dave, to distinguish him from Dave Jr., is a fan of the Boston Red Sox. So he's more familiar with success than we are, Matthew, I would say. Wow, congratulations. So I have, a, I have a question for you guys, if I can interrupt real quick. Like, how did you decide on what teams to root for? Do you have any sort of, like, geographic or family connections to your, like, respective teams? Or did you just kind of throw a dart at the board and see where it landed? Well, I, I had uh, a good reason. I've got a lot of family living in Vashon Island, Matthew. Oh, wow, yeah. Matthew as well, so I've got family connection there. And elsewhere in the West Coast, kind of down in, in Portland as well. But I've been to Seattle a few times over the years. So I was uh, I was committed that way. I I had more of a choice than you did, Matthew, but probably not much yeah. because my family wouldn't have been very forgiving if I'd gone elsewhere. I think although I went to a few Oakland games as well, actually. But Dave Junior, do you want to talk about how you decided the White Sox were for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, my decision process was a little bit in the middle, Matthew, of, of your two options uh, when you said that. So I was travelling across to Chicago, I think, three, three, four years ago. Uh, it's something that Richard, Alan and Dave and myself were just big, big sports fans. So when I travelled over, I wanted to see as many different sports as I could. Baseball, it really wasn't on my, my radar at that point. I just couldn't. It wasn't something that grabbed me. Um, but I think Alan specifically at the time said, you need to see the Cubs they're just on the back of winning the World Series. It'll be a great experience. You need to go along. And I was booked in to see the Cubs, I think, on a Sunday. And it just so happened that I could go along and see this little team. You know, the White Sox, and, and I didn't have a clue who they were, their history, anything. But it was, I think it was a midweek game at a really reasonable time of the day. I just went along and absolutely fell in love with everything. The way that they treated me on the day, um, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was a game against Detroit. It wasn't a big game. There wasn't a hell of a lot of people there. It wasn't an important game, but I just, I fell in love with everything that day to the extent where I didn't bother going to see the Cubs. I just thought, White Sox, what a day I had. And it's it's just stuck with me over that, that period of time. So it, it's like you said earlier before Dave came on, we've got a really, really exciting team this year. Last yeah. year was good. It, it didn't end. Obviously, it didn't end so well, but that's a team packed with power for this year. It's really exciting for me. And Alan, are you are you as excited for the Tigers this coming season? <laughs> my, my goal for the Tigers is that we're not fourth of the four teams between the four of us, but I'm probably relying on the Mariners to help me out there, Matthew. Mm-hmm. So for a while, we were neck and neck. The Tigers did did okay in the 60-game season, but then really just imploded in September. A, a new manager this year, we, we might see improvement, but if, if I can catch one of you three guys, that's that's my goal. So my reason is probably a more traditional reason, Matthew. Um, as Dave Jr. was saying, they were big sports fans. I was lucky in love and unlucky in sports. I met a woman from Michigan. Uh, <laughs> lions and Tigers and Red Wings. Yeah, you can't get it all, can you? I, I'm stuck with the, with the Tigers. So we've been over, we've done a few different series in different parts of the, the, the states on the East Coast. Alan's yeah. stuck with the Tigers, but his woman is stuck with him. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Yorkshire, Dave, how how come you root for the Red Sox? Yes, well, I didn't think I was sort of starting off with a team that was going to be so successful this century. You know, it's all about the Red Sox, apart from last season. But it was really on my first trip to America. I think it was the early 90s, probably about 93. It's a long time ago, so I can't quite remember why or how I got the tickets. I think it was sort of pre-internet, so I probably phoned them up. And when I got to the stadium, they had the tickets for me at the ticket office. And your first experience is is pretty important. And the lady behind the ticket office said, again, change days because it wasn't very busy in Fenway Park. And they said, uh, we've upgraded your tickets uh, because we're not that busy today. And they're on the sort of first base. I don't think we bought bleacher seat tickets. So that was a pretty good thing straight away. And it is a pretty impressive place, Fenway. If any sports stadium is going to impress you, then that's going to be one of them. And yeah, I liked it right from the very first time. I like cricket, um, which is a bat ball game in England. And there's some similarities there. So, And I got into the history of them and been to Boston a few times, but then kind of lost touch with what was going on until relatively recently again, when these guys uh, started up this podcast and it sort of rekindled my interest in the game. Great stuff, great stuff, Dave. And Matthew, yourself, obviously, you've mentioned that you're you're a man enough for life, there's no escaping that. Did you actually grow up in Seattle or, or the surrounding area? 
Yeah, I'm yeah, I grew up in the suburbs of Seattle and then now I do live in the city. So what feels like forever ago when we could go to games, I was going to a lot because now I'm 20 minutes away or an easy bus ride. But yeah, it was purely geographic. Like I grew up watching games with my grandpa and he would, you know, he was retired so he could watch every single game every night. And uh, Dave Niehaus certainly helped too, the old um, broadcaster. I think that's, you know, kind of like you were saying about your first experience going to the stadium, the experience of watching on TV if you're doing it every night for six months is so important and having Dave Niehaus kind of lead the way there was huge. But I do like every time someone asks me this, I do think about how things could have broke differently. Cause I also, um, I hosted a little, series on our podcast at Lookout Landing called Why I'm a Mariners Fan, where I talk to people and just ask all these like very therapeutic questions. Like, why do we do this? Like, why are we still supporting this team that has been since I would say in the 21st century, they are the worst American sports franchise there is. They haven't had no success. So like when you think about it in those terms, you're like, why would anyone continue doing this? And for me, it really is like, I just latched on so quickly i played baseball growing up so having that connection to like the sport was really helpful i definitely know a lot of people who i consider friends who still think baseball is very boring and are you know more geared towards like the combat sports and the violence and i'm kind of if i had not grown up playing baseball i don't know if i would feel the way i do about this sport but to answer your question yeah i just grew up here don't really remember the kingdom a lot of my early experiences I was gonna ask, are- you must just have missed it Yeah, I have like, it feels like fever dreams, you know, the memories I do have. I was very young. I remember, actually, my main kingdom memory was when I was in preschool and we had a field trip to the kingdom on an off day. There was no Mariners or Seahawks stuff going on. So they just let us run around on the turf and kind of explained the history and showed us like the locker rooms. Yeah, that was really cool. But then, you know, a year later, they blew it up. So, (laughs) but all of my memories start at like the Ichiro Safeco Field era. And, and how would you compare that as a, a stadium to the, the other American baseball stadiums, Matthew, trying to be objective? Uh, yeah, I, I really like it. I haven't been to like Fenway or Wrigley, any of the like old school ones where it's like yeah. the charm is kind of in how small and shitty they are. <laughs> um, you know, for lack, like it's, it has a very rustic feel to it. Like, oh, this was built, you know, before the war. So it's a much different. I've heard at Fenway, there are some seats where like you're not even facing home plate, like the way that they're angled, you're like looking out to left field or whatever and have to crane <laughs> your neck. So I like Safeco Field for the uh, convenience, obviously, but also I do think it holds up really well against the other stadiums I've been to. Petco Park in San Diego is my other favorite, oh. just because it has kind of a similar feel where it's definitely like a ballpark. Like it doesn't feel like too commercialized. Uh, or, or like, you know, Yankee Stadium kind of looks like a like an airport terminal, you know, there's nothing very like cool or like unique to it, whereas Safeco has like the roof, I think is very cool. I love how when you're walking around the concourse getting beer or whatever, you can still see the field the whole time. I think that's super important. So you can, you know, people who don't love baseball as much as us, they can like walk around, you know, you can keep them entertained without having to sit there and watch nine innings. So I, I have no complaints about Safeco Field at all. It just could be cheaper. I get that, I get that. So have you had a favorite player over your years watching the, the Mariners? Does anyone stand out for you? Yeah, the first one was Mike Cameron, who wasn't like a superstar. He was just like a, a good player. He was the center fielder who took over after Griffey. In in hindsight, like that's incredible. That's a job that you know you wouldn't wish on anyone taking over for Griffey in center field. But that wasn't like why I loved him. I, now when I think about it, I'm like, wow, he did a great job. But I just thought he was so cool. He had like, you know, the hat to the side and he wore earrings on the field and that was still allowed. He was my like childhood favorite. And then it, the ones after that are obvious. It's just Ichiro and Felix because they were the reasons to watch. Yeah. I definitely, I feel like if Felix had left, I wouldn't have blamed him. You know, like he had every reason to not want to play for the Mariners and he stuck around. So that was very endearing. You could tell that like the organization meant something to him. It wasn't just the people who signed his checks. So I loved him for that. Ichiro was kind of like, I don't, it's hard to explain <laughs> Ichiro. Like as a child, especially, you feel like he's an alien. Like he doesn't really, he doesn't talk very much with the media. Like he plays baseball in such a different way that it was impossible not to be drawn to him. Um, but like, I don't feel like I have the personal connection with him that I do with Felix, because like I said, Ichiro was just sort of distant in a way that makes sense, obviously. Like, you know, if I played baseball in Japan, I wouldn't probably talk to the media very much. <laughs> Alan just checking Mike Cameron no relation Alan I'm guessing no relation but his son obviously is at the Tigers that, that's mm, Cameron that's right 
Daz came out out as a rookie last year because that that was my that that's my goal and and Dave Junior was good enough to get get me a sticker with the number forty one for Daz Cameron on on it. But I, I need I need to get myself a Tigers official Tigers jersey. I can get now get one with my name and the number forty one on it. So. He he had a sticky start. You know, he he started getting a few hits, a few RBIs. So he's done well. So I'm hoping to see quite a bit of him this year as well. But Mike Mike Cameron was a well travelled ball player as well, wasn't he? Hall of Fame nomination, Mike. So yeah, uh, good good to hear that name. But yeah, it's good good the Camerons uh, are making a bit of an influence coming back into MLB as well. Yeah, that made me feel old too, which is rare. Like that was one of my first. You know, now we have this whole wave of like you know Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Bo Bichette. Daz Cameron, all these guys who are the kids of people I grew up watching, which is kind of a trip, but I guess it's just going to only get worse. And now every manager, too, is a former player that I remember. Like, you had Brad Osmus for a little bit, and I was like, he was playing two years ago. That was a very weird moment for me. Sadly, Matthew, you have to get used to that. Trust me, it only gets worse from here on in. Oh, I know. Yeah. As we can all confirm. The, the other teams in the AL West, then, Matthew, who who do you think the Mariners have, been, have to watch out for most? among the rivals in the AL West? Yeah, good question. I think this year specifically, I, I say this every year, but I think the Angels on paper look really good, but the Angels are just the kings of finding ways to ruin their own franchise. I want to start mentally preparing for the Astros to not be good anymore. So I'm going to start this year. Like I think this is the year they finally take a real step back. It helps that they lose George Springer, and I don't know what Verlander's arm is going to look like anymore. And then Oakland, you know, they always give us problems. So the Oakland and Anaheim are kind of on the opposite ends for me. Where Anaheim, I'm always like, this team looks really good on paper, and then they ruin it. And Oakland, I'm like, who are these guys? They're, you know, they're going to be 500 at best, and then they make the playoffs and go 15 and 5 against the Mariners every year. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm ready to rule out. I don't understand what Texas is doing. They're not a threat to me at all. Not that the Mariners are a threat either, but I'd be happy if the Mariners finish above Texas. That's kind of what I'm preparing. That makes a lot of sense, I think. And you mentioned, Matthew, that as well as being a, a fan and extremely knowledgeable about baseball that you played growing up as well, what position did you play? I started as a middle infielder, mostly second base, a little bit of shortstop. And then once kids started hitting the ball a lot harder and it gets on you a lot quicker, then I asked to move to the outfield. I remember I was taking ground balls at practice once and one of them bounced up and hit me in the face. And I quickly realized that it's a lot harder to get hit in the face if you play the outfield. So I moved to center field. (laughs) That sounds very sensible. Very sensible. I was going to ask if you guys have any experience with baseball or even just like beer league, softball, anything like that. Dave Jr., do you want to field that one? Oh, I mean, baseball, certainly in schools here, it would be unheard of. To be honest, you may, you know, somebody when you're young, they may have been away in America and they bring back a ball and bat and it's a novelty for a few weeks and everybody plays. But I think the closest we would get in the UK may be rounders, which again, it's it's, it's our version of baseball. Dave would probably talk a whole lot more about it. Yeah, it's, it's the closest we would have and we would certainly play aspects of that at school. So it would never be a big part of the curriculum over here for sports we would always be focused more on, on football or kind of soccer but perhaps in England a bit more around cricket so there may be better links there yeah I mean we've we've talked about it as a group yeah, again with baseball not being hugely popular here there just aren't the, the opportunities for four old guys like us to rock up to a batting cage because there just aren't any facilities certainly in Scotland there may be one or two but it's not something that's near anybody's home so it's once lockdown is over so once um, all the things that are keeping us indoors over here in the UK are, are gone it's something we've absolutely talked about is just seeing if we're any good <laughs> which I think we all know the answer to but <laughs> see, just see how bad we are maybe uh, more appropriate Except it could be entertaining at least I think and we're fortunate Matthew as well we've made good links with various other people within the UK baseball community so there's a couple oh, of nice. opportunities there for us to go and get some getting some batting cages and potentially get some pitches thrown at us as well so that will be highly entertaining I think but Yorkshire Dave coming from the home of cricket uh, you know at least plenty about hitting a, a ball with a bat did you see much much opportunity to play baseball growing up 
No, although, uh, as Dave said, I can remember at primary school that rounders was a thing. And I also remember, even though very young, that I found it very difficult to hit the ball as a batter because you're obviously hitting the ball on the full, as we say. In cricket, usually, the, ba- the ball bounces before. And it, I don't know whether that why that makes it easier to hit, but it, it, it just is. I did play a little bit of cricket all, Funnily enough, more so when I moved to Scotland, because where I'm from in England, Yorkshire is quite famous for being cricket. So when I moved to Edinburgh, I remember this guy coming up to me in the office and he worked in a different for a different company and they had a cricket team. And when they heard there was a guy from Yorkshire in this office next door, he came over and asked if I would go on. And I had to, you know, I said, look, I don't I don't really play cricket. I'm a, and nevertheless, I, st- I started playing for them and just about managed to hold my own. But it was, it was, uh, cricket is, it's a bat and ball game, but it's totally different in terms of batting, I think. And I did have a go in a batting cage in a bar in a basement near Wrigley, <laughs> near Wrigley Field. Again, I found real difficulty in hitting the ball, even, I think I put the setting on to, ended up putting the setting on to softball. And then, you know, sort of worked up from there. But, yeah, I find it really difficult. I did one of these pitching machine things, which made yes, also yes, speed, your, speed your pitching at, and that was highly embarrassing as well. Uh, it really brought home how fast these guys actually threw it as well. So it was... Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. There is a... I mean, you mentioned you... Have you been to Safeco Field? I know you mentioned you went to a couple of games in Oakland, but have you been... To, or, excuse me, T-Mobile Park is what it's called now. Have you been in person? I've not, Matthew. I've actually been to the Kingdom. That's how old I am, Matthew. Oh, okay. I've been to the Kingdom, but I'm not under the kind of since 2000. So, yeah, I've not been to T-Mobile Park. Yeah, well, what I was going to say is you can go during pre-game, especially, and then also, I guess, during the game, if a reliever is warming up, you can get, like, 10 feet away from the bullpen and watch them warm up. And it's that exact thought every time. Like, how does anyone hit this? You can't even, you hear it, the ball more than you see it. And you realize that a lot of these guys are just, when they're hitting, are just picking a spot and hoping that's where the ball ends up, which is a crazy thing to do for a living. That's incredible. Is, is there a lot of that aspect to it, Matthew? I've often wondered about how little time the batsman has to see the ball. Is he more or less predicting what the pitcher is going to pitch at him in the same way that the catcher calls the game and you can probably, you know, which pitches the pitcher is best in his armory? Yeah. I mean, to an extent, you hear a lot about like when, you know, a hitter's up there, the announcers will say, oh, he's a pure guess hitter. Like that's when you get a lot of power hitters who, when they swing and miss, it looks very silly because they're swinging as hard as they can. And Is that what's happening there, yeah. <laughs> A lot of the times, yeah. But then, I mean, like the truly elite, like Edgar Martinez, perfect example. He was a kind of hitter who he would see the ball and just hit it where it's pitched. So if it's outside, go to right field. If it's inside, pull your hands in and try to pull it. And that's impossible. Like, that's when you realize how good these guys are and why he's in the Hall of Fame. Like, to actually see the ball and adjust mid-flight rather than sort of guess beforehand is what separates the best. Yeah, they must be, they must have something extra, you know, think really quickly, have incredibly good eyesight. I seem to remember, I don't know whether this is true or not, it's just coming from somewhere in my mind, Mark McGuire, when he was going for the, the, the home run chase with Sosa, did I hear that he wore contact lenses, but he had a, like a higher prescription in his contact oh. lenses, almost to try and improve his eyesight? Now, I don't know whether I've never checked this online or anything. Yeah. It's just something that I think I, you know, I read somewhere that maybe trying everything to get an, an edge and see the ball quicker, easier. I don't know that story either, but I would believe it. The one that I remember was uh, Josh Hamilton when he was playing for Texas. He changed up his contact lenses or did something different with his lenses because he said he couldn't see the ball during day games. It was too bright or something. So then he changed his contact lenses and like won the MVP, which is I'm sure there was more to it. But that was like part of what catalyzed him becoming a good player, which is like so funny to me that it was that simple. You yeah, I hear that floodlights makes a big difference to batting. So perhaps, I don't know, is it possible to get contact lens uh, shades kind of thing? That <laughs> screen, screens out the, the glare of the lights. Maybe before we get to the, a real batting cage, we would probably need like Marvel superhero style eyesight, I think, for us to have a go at that too. <laughs> 
Yeah, so in terms of, of your kind of baseball experience then, Matthew, obviously you played, you, you're now very knowledgeable, got a great podcast going there. And I noticed as well, Matthew, like you've done a lot of writing as well. You're a writer as well as a, a podcaster there. And, and we caught up with uh, some friends of ours on another British baseball podcast, and it's a, an all-female podcast. It's called Birds With Balls, and they talk a lot about the female experience of sports and we we're talking the other day about what America and what MLB does well and what it doesn't do so well. I just wondered what you'd seen in terms of the how welcoming the Mariners are for women, how progressive an organisation it is, because obviously others like the Mets in recent times have fallen down in quite dramatic fashion. So I just wondered where you'd put the Mariners on that scale. Yeah, they're uh, they're somewhere in the middle, I would guess. I mean, there's so much behind the scenes that we don't see, obviously. And I'm sure that every single one of our favorite sports teams in any sport has some skeletons in the closet that we don't know about. But the Mariners publicly do a decent job. They do have a lot of women who work in the front office or cover the team on a regular basis. Shannon Dreyer doesn't work for the team, but she's a beat writer for a local station up here that I really like. Um, They have a lot of, they do a lot of things well on the surface, but like I said, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes. And I don't know if you were following the team very closely when the Lorena Martin scandal happened. She was a trainer, nutritionist. I don't remember her exact title, high performance director or something like that. Some Jerry DePoto term. Uh, She alleged that there was some misbehavior going on. She was treated unfairly because she was a woman and because she was Latina, which kind of disappeared, which is also the bummer. Like when this stuff happens, like you hear about it, it's in the news. And then a week later, no one's talking about it. Like, I don't even know if she's working in baseball anymore or if she moved on. That was the biggest thing that I can remember for the Mariners where I was like, I don't know if I should, you know, it makes you like question kind of blindly supporting a business. Cause that's at the end of the day, the Mariners Every sports team is a business and the product is just the team that you like watching. So like any multi-million dollar corporation, there are some problems for sure. I'm happy that the Mariners haven't had to like, you know, fire someone over a Kevin or what's the guy's name, a Jared Porter situation. Like we haven't reached that part. I mean, I don't feel great about the state of Major League Baseball as a whole. I think that there's probably, like I said, a lot of things that we don't see that are much worse than the things we do see. I try not to think too hard about that, you know, just maybe focus on what I can focus on what makes me happy and what makes me like the game rather than all the stuff that makes me upset. Absolutely. That makes a a lot of sense as well, Matthew. And I guess for us as as UK sports fans, one of the things about baseball is I know how important the Mariners are to the city of Seattle. But obviously baseball teams do move. Teams move cities, franchises, sometimes move to totally different parts of the world. Can you imagine the Mariners ever doing that? And what would be the impact on the city of Seattle? Well, we had a test run. The the Supersonics left when I was in middle school, um, which was devastating. I mean, the Sonics were... They were kind of, they had it, they had sort of bragging rights first because they were very good in the 70s and were winning championships. Were very cool, sort of the most nationally relevant Seattle team. And then, you know, you the 90s with Peyton and Sean Kemp, it kind of comes back like they're going toe to toe with Michael Jordan. And then I think about 10 years after that finals against Jordan, they were gone. Um, so we definitely have experience with that. I think every Seattle sports fan is very guarded now because of that feeling and knowing that things can get ripped away from you in an instant and they'll move the team to Oklahoma. I can't imagine the Mariners leaving just because I think. Oh, there's a lot of different variables here. I think the stadium certainly helped. I think once they built Safeco Field, that sort of locked them in because there was a lot of rumors that they were going to leave in the 90s. You know, the classic 95 story about them playing during a local election where if it loses, they're going to move to Tampa, and all that. So like that, once the once the Mariners made the playoffs in 1995 and beat the Yankees, I think they cemented their legacy here forever because once you have that giant stadium and it is one of the good stadiums, it becomes a lot harder to tear that down and leave. A couple of questions I would like to ask as well, Matthew, if I can. Sure, yeah. I was reading a bit about the, so obviously we heard your expectations maybe overall for the Mariners in, in 2021. Interesting, they seem to be one of the few teams pushing a, a six-man rotation in the pitching lineup. Is, is that is that something you agree with? I think so. I think it makes sense for the Mariners specifically. I wouldn't want every team to do this. I think if you have five good starting pitchers, those should be your five good starting yeah. pitchers. 
The problem for the Mariners is that they have like two and a half right now. Like I love Marco Gonzalez and he's the reason why I am a little upset about the six man rotation because adding another pitcher to the lineup is, means less innings for him. And he's very competitive. He's one of the people that like has endeared himself to the fans, kind of like Felix did where it was like, you can tell that he cares. He's not just going out there and collecting a paycheck. That makes me upset. I think just less chances to see Marco is probably a net negative for the Mariners. But at the same time, like the back four of the rotation have not really proven themselves. So you might as well, in a season where you're probably not going to make the playoffs anyway, might as well just roll six guys out there and see who the five best are. I don't, I think ideally they wouldn't have it all season, right? Like five guys will sort of rise to the top and we can say that's our rotation cut the last guy move into the bullpen or whatever Uh, I think it's you know like I said earlier though or I don't know if I did say this but I like when the Mariners try like my reason that I'm upset with them right now is because they haven't tried to get better at all this offseason but so at least like this is an on the field version of trying like you know we haven't had a lot of success anyway might as well do something new it's better than like just you know trying the same things and having the same poor results so when you say they've not done much in the offseason you're, you're referring to trades no, no no big trades coming in yeah trades and mostly free agents though because free agents you don't have to give anything up all they cost is money and every team in the league can afford free agents you know like it doesn't make sense for the mariners to throw 200 million dollars at a player but you can spend 5 million on a starting pitcher. They haven't even done that. Like all of their acquisitions this offseason have been relievers who they signed for like less than a million dollars. They're they're not really trying to make any like big splashes, which is why I'm upset with them because trades, you know, you, I can understand not wanting to make a trade because you don't want to give up so and so who turns out to be good in five years but free agency it's just you know you have this money to spend and you're not spending it that's very frustrating for the common fan i think are there any young prospects we could expect to see we should be looking out for i hope so that's where the money resides right now for the mariners we i mean we at lookout landing are big we follow the minor leagues pretty hard like i would say one of the best outlets in the world for mariners minor league coverage and a lot of that is because that's been the only point of intrigue for a while like since cano left that was when the shift started we're like okay we're getting younger we're going to be bad on the major league level with a really good minor league system um today a bunch of new prospect rankings came out in like team rankings and someone said the mariners have the second best farm system in all of major league baseball which is great because they were dead last for a while there was nothing to look forward to once they started rebuilding that's what made me mm, happy is not the right word it made me like from a business perspective understand what they were doing because you don't want to be rolling out a bunch of 35 year olds you'd rather kind of start over and hope that these guys can blossom so the guys that i'm looking forward to the most jared kelnick and julio rodriguez are the two outfielders that you'll find on every top 10 list kelnick is the one they got in exchange for cano which is still so funny to me i don't know if you guys know the backstory but when they traded robinson cano to the mets the mets general manager was cano's former agent so he was basically doing his friend a solid and saying hey you can come back to new york where you liked it leave seattle like seattle is very isolated geographically from not only the rest of America, but especially the Dominican Republic where he's from. So like a lot of players don't necessarily like playing in Seattle, which is a whole other problem that we won't get into. But so getting Kalanick for basically like a favor, (laughs) I thought was very funny. Like just the old... The old agent being like, yeah, come on home, buddy. You don't have to play in Seattle anymore. So I just think that that story on top of him actually being very good is just like a nice bit of satisfaction for me. And then Julio is like, he's the dream. He's what you want all of your prospects to be. He loves baseball so much in a way that a lot of American players don't seem to express, particularly white American players. They're kind of bred to not show a lot of emotion, you know, respect the game in heavy air quotes. Julio is the opposite of that. I think I think when he hits his first major league home run, he'll probably throw his bat into the bleachers and dance around the infield, which is what I like. I mean, I know a lot of people disagree, but if you're playing a game for a living, you might as well have fun. So that's what Julio represents. Kalanick is the white boy from the Midwest of America who's like very, you know, chip on his shoulder. Like his whole thing is that like he's been overlooked, which is very weird when he's just like a first round pick and signed a million dollar signing bonus. Like he wasn't necessarily like, He didn't have to overcome a lot of adversity, I think, but he acts like he does, which I guess is one way to sort of motivate yourself. So those two are definitely the ones that I think if you're a Mariners fan, you hope that they're the ticket out of of last place. And then they got some pitchers too, but, you know, pitching prospects are so hard to to figure out because, you know, one bad pitch and your elbow explodes. But I do I do think they have they have a good thing going. Logan Gilbert will probably be in the major leagues. 
uh, this season. I hope at least. I mean, if things yeah. have gone badly, if he's not up, he was yeah another first round pick, another top 100 prospect. I think. I mean, I'm not. I don't. I can't claim to watch a lot of minor league baseball or college baseball, so I haven't seen them play a whole lot. But I. I mean, the people who do watch a lot of it and write those top 100 lists, they put them on there, so they must be pretty good. And Matthew, I know a lot of our listeners as well as I love baseball, but they love hearing a bit about. America and, and the cities in which the baseball teams play. For, for sure. some of our listeners who, who don't know a lot about Seattle, uh, perched up there at the top of the Pacific Northwest, could you tell our listeners a little bit about what kind of place your home city is? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so like I mentioned, Seattle is very geographically isolated from the rest of the United States. Signing a contract with the Mariners also means signing up for the longest flights of any Major League Baseball player. Like The Mariners lead the league in air miles every season. You know, when you're flying that much, I'm sure it takes a toll on your body, especially if you have swelling or you have any kind of soreness. You don't want to sit on a plane to Baltimore for five hours, which makes sense. Like, if you're not, if you don't have any West Coast connection, I understand why you wouldn't want to play for the Mariners, which is a sad truth. I think a lot of people associate the Pacific Northwest with like Washington and Oregon, you know, like Seattle and Portland as kind of brother and sister cities. Something that I like telling people that not a lot of people realize that Seattle is actually closer to Canada than it is to Portland, Oregon. So we're way up here. There's not, um, there's not a lot of like things around, you know, like you're, you're in the city of Seattle or you're in the woods or, you, you know, you can go north and go to Canada. Portland is another major city. And then, you know, Portland's surrounded by the woods too. So we're like, we're in Sasquatch country. You know, everyone thinks if Bigfoot does exist, he probably lives up here. And it takes a toll on baseball players, I'm sure. Like it rains a lot. That's the other stereotype, you know, which is true. But the thing that people don't realize is it does rain a lot, but it never rains very hard. It's always just a drizzle. You don't get like big storms. You don't get floods or anything. It's just going to be gray and sort of uncomfortable from October through March. And then the rest of the time, it's beautiful. So like if you're here during baseball (laughs) season, yeah, if you're here during baseball season, you'll fall in love for sure. That's why I think the stadium is so great. You can be outside and in the sun. I mean, Seattle is, it's definitely a weird place. It's not for everyone. And the other thing you'll hear, the other kind of stereotype is about the Seattle freeze, which is like this theory that sort of the coldness and the the grayness makes people very shut in. They don't want to go outside or talk to anyone. So a lot of people when they travel and they meet the locals, they say, these people are unfriendly. They don't want to talk to me, which I think is kind of true. Seattle's not a big, like, talk to strangers kind of city. Even if you go to a bar where, like, you think it's, you know, a communal atmosphere, everyone's having a good time, it's going to be 25 different tables having 25 different conversations. And that's how I would explain Seattle. It's going to be hard to to make friends, for sure, which is why I'm grateful to have grown up here and kind of have a foundation. I think the idea of moving to Seattle, especially if you're from like a warm weather climate where everyone's very talkative and friendly, it would be a huge culture shock. But I love it. I mean, I've grew up here. It's hard not to have sort of an admiration for the place you grew up in. Baseball wise, it can have its take its toll for sure, because any of the like Latin players, for instance, who are from the Caribbean, like they'd much rather go to the East Coast than way up to the basically southern Canada. Makes, makes a lot of sense. I've got to say, Matthew, you've got family in Vashon and also a shout out to my cousin in Takama as well. So I know I know a little bit about Washington State. Seattle's still a great music city as well. Yeah, it's uh it's not as you know what it was in the nineties for sure. We don't have any Kurt Cobains hanging out anymore, at least not on a mainstream level. There might be some genius in his basement somewhere working on something. I mean, it's still it's still a cool place for sure. There's a lot of record labels here and you will get a lot of like independent, you know, sort of indie artists who spring up from the local scene. It's been tough. I mean, we haven't been able to go to concerts for 10 months now. So that has been a little bit of a bummer because it is it is a fun place to go see a show. A lot of artists also when they come here, like on tour, they seem to really like Seattle. You can you can always tell, I think. I mean, I go to a lot of concerts and you can tell when the artist is just kind of phoning it in, trying to get back on the bus versus like, oh, I like this crowd. I'm going to give them a good show. Seattle, you get a lot of good shows, at least for rock music. Rap is a little different. It is a very, Seattle is a very white city as well, which I think is part of the geographic isolation. You know, you don't get a lot of (laughs) immigration from the Caribbean or, you know, anything like that. I mean, like I said, I really like Seattle. I feel like I'm rambling now thinking about like the scope of your question. I'm like, what is Seattle? How do I feel about it? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, it has changed a lot too. I forgot to mention that Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they're all right in our backyard. So like Google pretty much bought a whole block in my neighborhood. I've lived two blocks away from like a massive Google office and they, they really did buy the whole block and build like a massive office. You have really good internet connection in Seattle then. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. It is a good place to be on the internet for sure. Uh, just um, again, before we go on, I just wanted to point out to anyone listening, Matthew, you've done a huge favour this morning for yourself. Again, we really appreciate you coming on at this time. Um, something else we wanted to check as well. Richard mentioned about your writing earlier. You've also got the podcast. How can our followers find you online? What can our guys do to, to just check out what you're doing? But also, as a second part to the question, I was wondering, sporting rivalry is huge in the UK. As a Mariners fan, who do you hate? So what team do you most want to see the Mariners roll over when they come to town and sweep them aside? So again, if you could let us know about how our guys can follow you, but also I would love to know who you hate, but also why. I'd be really interested in that. Even if it's something trivial, the worse the better. Yeah, I love this question. I'm going to start with the rivalry one and then I'll let you know where you can follow me and all that. Because it is a bit of a complicated question when it comes to the Mariners, right? Because a lot of rivalry comes with, you know, like Yankees, Red Sox, they're competing to win the division or to go to the World Series. Whereas with the Mariners, it's like we're competing to not be in last place. So there's not like a true rival in terms of like we're both fighting for something that the, the other team wants. I think naturally in baseball, you hate the teams in your own division. The Astros are in a class of their own right now for hate because they cheated. So it's very easy to hate them. But even before the cheating scandal came out, I didn't necessarily hate them because to me, they were kind of the blueprint, right? They were awful. Like they were the worst team in the league for a long time and then used their draft picks and used their you know, resources to become better, which is what I want the Mariners to do, right? Like the Mariners have had all these top draft picks now that came from years of losing. So I want them to sort of follow the Astros model, follow the Cubs model. I mean, both of those teams won the World Series doing that, even though the Astros were probably cheating. So the Astros, I'm going to put in their own little bucket. The team that I hate the most is the Angels, for sure. Because I just think they're a stupid franchise, for lack of a better term. I don't know. You guys probably don't know a lot of the details. Um, The Angels, were they've had so many name changes. They were the California Angels first, so they just claimed the entire state. That's stupid. California is huge. It's probably, I would make five or six times the size of Scotland. I don't know, but it's California is unbelievably huge. So to claim that as your whole state, very stupid. Then they were the Anaheim Angels, which is the city that they're actually in. That one made sense. You have the alliteration, like Anaheim Angels, that all sounds great. And then recently, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, they decided we're going to be the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, which doesn't make any sense. Like that's, it's too long. It's too hard to say. Those are two different cities. Like Richard, you mentioned Tacoma, like, Seattle is about as far away from Tacoma as Anaheim is from Los Angeles. So they're different places completely. And the Angels not only are going to say, we're not from Anaheim anymore, we're from Los Angeles. But like anyone in this entire country knows the Dodgers run Los Angeles. Like if you think Los Angeles baseball, it's the Dodgers. No one is going to think Angels. Like the fact that they call themselves Los Angeles is very stupid. You're going to get erased by everyone who's a Dodgers fan. They don't know how to use Mike Trout. Like that's hilarious to me. They have the best player we're ever going to see and they don't make the playoffs that makes them very easy to like punch down at you know like haha like we're bad but you like you should be good and you're bad that to me is worse and um, there's so many things the fact that so los angeles angels or no sorry if you say if you say the phrase the los angeles angels that in spanish translates to the the angels angels like it's very redundant the the and los mean the same thing and angeles and angels mean the same thing so the name, it's just so stupid. Everything about them is so stupid. Their stadium is bad. I've been there. It's just a nothing stadium. Like there's nothing cool about it. The other teams within our division, I can respect at least. Like Oakland, they do their thing so well. Like they're in fear. They're like a thorn in our side. And I don't want them to ever win the World Series, but I can respect what they do because they're very good at it. Texas is kind of just whatever. Like I don't really have any opinions on Texas. I'm neutral on Texas, I guess. And then the other big ones that a lot of Mariner fans hate are the Yankees. I don't really feel that way. That started in the 90s, mostly when they were playing in the playoffs. I don't really, I personally, I dislike the Red Sox a lot more than the Yankees. I just think the Yankees are like cooler and the Red Sox are like a bunch of hooligans who are just going to yell at you and, you know, 
a lot of history of racism, which isn't great. You know, the Yankees, obviously, they've been around for so long that there's a lot of bad stuff, too. The Red Sox are much more open about it. I'll say that. Angels first, and then probably the Red Sox are my my second most hated team, just from a personal standpoint. I think Mariners fans would say Angels, Astros. But like I said, the Astros, to me, are they're a whole other thing now because they actually cheat. Oh, and then I guess where you can find me. That was the other part of the question. Sorry, <laughs> I got excited because I love I love talking about how much I hate the Angels. That was um, a fantastic. You answer. can follow me on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm passionate about it, as you can tell. You can find me on Twitter. That's the easiest way to see everything that I write and see all when the podcasts come out. So I'm at mroberson22. Uh, it's basically Robertson with no T. So R-O-B-E-R-S-O-N. And then the number 22, lookoutlanding.com is where all my writing is and where we host the podcast. So you can find everything on there. Part of SB Nation, if anyone reads the the mother site, they're the ones who own all of our stuff. So SB Nation is like the, the main site and then they have a team site for Every team in America, which is very cool. So Lookout Landing has a fun comment section. If you want to jump in and argue about the manners with people, you can do that. Uh, we do a lot of more serious, like critical things where we yell at the team for being frustrating. And then we also do a lot of sillier, like jokey, lighthearted stuff, as well as, like I mentioned, a lot of great minor league coverage. It's very well-rounded. That's why I love working with the people I work with and writing for the site. We have everything a Mariners fan would want. So you can find all of it at lookoutlanding.com. Lookout Landing, actually, I should mention, I think I say that a lot. And then a lot of people are like, what does that mean? Lookout Landing was a bar in T-Mobile Park that they actually just got rid of, which is very, very sad. But they didn't get rid of it. It's still there, but they changed the name. It's much more like corporate branded bullshit. It looks like a like a resort now instead of a bar. But that's that's where the name comes from. Because I think I, you know people will become numb to it you hear it over and over lookout landing lookout landing and no one explains what it means Um, but go to lookoutlanding.com read all of our stuff we have a whole staff of great writers and i'm sure even if you're not a mariners fan there's something for everyone on there we'll certainly do that matthew and we'll encourage all of our highland bullpen listeners to do that as well and my fellow mariner matthew thank you so much for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure and we'll obviously be hoping the mariners have a great season but I know the other guys will be looking forward to seeing you humble those angels as well. We'll all cheer, cheer you on. Yeah, last season they finished ahead of the angels, which was great. Uh, hopefully they can do that again. The angels always look like they're going to be better than they are. So who knows? Like they could win the World Series or finish in last place. I don't know what the angels We know which one we'll be rooting for anyway. Matthew, thank you so exactly. much. Exactly. Thank you, guys. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate thank you having you, me. Thank, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Much appreciate it. Thank you. Big thanks to Matthew for joining us on the show tonight. Uh, we hope it was good. We hope you got some good knowledge about the Mariners for the season. We'll be having a few more of these with our teams before the season launches. Next up will be the Boston Red Sox. Mm-hmm.